Let us bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Loving Father and our God, we come before you this morning uh, because we need you. We need you not only right now, but we need you every moment of every hour. Lord, in all that our world is going through, your people today need you. As we heard in uh, the testimony in music, the sermon and song, that which binds us together is what you have done for each one of us. Some of us in this place know what it's like to be on the doorstep of death. Some of us in this place know what it's like when our loved ones are lying at the doorstep of death. Some of us know what it is like to cross that threshold and mourn that which we have lost and that which could have been and should have been. Some of us know what it's like to be rescued from the pit of sin and still others of us know what it's like to be rescued from financial ruin, from relational and family destruction. All of us are here because you have done something and you want to do something more still for us. And we need you. We need you because our selfishness interrupts what you would do for us. We need you because the enemy of souls would take our eyes off of what you long to do for us and who you are. So I pray, dear Father, that you would draw our minds together to you and may the preaching of your word be used as imperfect a tool as it is to help accomplish your desire for us today. May Jesus be seen, known, and heard. And our time is what we ask in his precious name. Let all the people of God say. Amen. I just want to, um, as a way of reminder, let everyone know that we do have a Pathfinder Club. It's officially been registered, and tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 3, if your children are interested, please bring them. If you are interested because you want to help your poor pastor along, we would welcome each and every one of you. <clears throat> This is a short statement and it encompasses the mission of our church. You will be seeing more of it, hearing more about it. The mission that God has placed on us is one of reaching our community and touching the world with a Christ-centered message of hope and wholeness. Reaching our community and touching the world with a Christ-centered message of hope and wholeness. <clears throat> in his beautiful TED talk, John Sutherland, an officer in London's police department, explains a principle. Please follow me as we will deal with this subject briefly. He explains a principle in forensic science called low curds exchange principle developed by 
Dr. Edmund Locher, known as the Sherlock Holmes of France. This principle has a simple premise. Every contact leaves a trace. Let me say that again. Every contact leaves a trace. In other words, in his context, every criminal leaves a trace behind him. One forensic expert put it in this way. Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, wherever he leaves, even unconsciously will serve as a silent witness against him. Not only his fingerprints or his footprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothing, the glass he breaks, the paint he scratches, the blood he deposits or collects. This is evidence that does not forget. Sutherland explains how this principle applies not just to forensic science, but in fact to all human relations. Every time two people come into contact with one another, an exchange takes place. Whether between lifelong friends or passing strangers, we encourage, we ignore, we hold out a hand or we withdraw it, we walk towards or we walk away, we bless or we curse, and every single contact leaves a trace. The way that we treat and regard one another matters, it really matters. Now there are some of us seated here today as a testament to our differences who think when we hear this, ew. Every time I come in contact with someone, I touch someone, and especially living in a, I don't know if we're post-COVID yet, world or society, we have a heightened sense of awareness when it comes to the transmission of bacteria and germs and all of these things. Some of us think to ourselves, that is disgusting. The reaction is to withdraw ourselves because the knowledge of this type of exchange seems like an invasion of my personal space, in the least contamination at the worst. There's someone here who's perhaps a germaphobe who is saying, amen. This is what I've been saying to you people all along. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus shares something that I believe puts Lokard's principle into context. Matthew chapter 5, and I will begin with verse 10. This is the New King James version. Blessed are those, and this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, of course, blessed are those who are persecuted. Who are what, my friends? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then Jesus goes on to say this. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in 
heaven. Wow. I don't know if you got that or if you missed it. Right after Jesus speaks to his followers about being persecuted. And anyone who has ever truly and authentically experienced persecution knows that the response after being persecuted is to withdraw in order to protect oneself, is it not? And it's almost as though Jesus senses that those who will hear, even though he pronounces a blessing upon those who are experiencing this, it is as though he senses what the response of those who will potentially experience this type of persecution would be. And he knows that our response would be to draw back. And so immediately he counters and says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Salt is not to remain salt by itself. Light is not to be hidden. These things are in fact, my dear friends, to come in contact, the light with the darkness, the salt with the food. So where we would, mm, we would be inclined to draw away from the world, Jesus reminds us that we are here to engage the world. The late John Stott said this, God's new society, the church, is as different from the old society as salt from rotting meat and as light from darkness. But there are too many people, listen to this, who stop there. Too many people whose whole preoccupation is with survival. That is, maintaining their distinction. The salt must retain its saltness. It must not become contaminated, they say. The light must retain its brightness. It must not be smothered by the darkness. That is true, but that is survival. Salt and light are not just a bit different from their environment. They are to have a powerful influence on their environment. So many, unfortunately, and th just this week, I was in a conversation with a friend of mine. So many, unfortunately, are Christians who are comfortable inside of a salt shaker. Because as long as we remain in the salt shaker, we remain uncontaminated by the world. Our doctrines are pure and we are pure and our children are pure, so we think. And we have mistakenly adopted this philosophy as what it means to be Christians. Beloved, Jesus suggests something that is vastly different. Vastly different. The first thing I want to share with you is being a part of God's church is not primarily about protecting the truth. Let me, let me just say that again. Being a part of God's church is not primarily about protecting the truth. Now, you, you're wondering why am I saying this? Here's why. Because the truth doesn't need you to protect it. It's the truth whether you or I believe it or not. It's the truth whether other people believe it or not, whether they accept it or not. The truth is simply the truth. Being a part of God's church is not primarily about protecting truth. Listen to me, my friends, but integrating truth into people's lives. What a horrible mistake we make if that is the mistake we make. Listen to what Jesus said in another passage, and I'm not going to go into this one, but ju just to solidify this concept. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said, the field is the, come on, beloved, the field is the, the field is the world. 
The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. Now, let me ask you a question, which I know, I'm sure you all know the answers to. Where does the seed go? It goes into the soil. And he just told us that the soil in this context is the, is the world. So the seed is dispersed into the world. Are you following me? Yes or no? And as, my dear friends, you and I come in contact with the world, we should have an influence. Now, Lokert's exchange principle is important because it suggests at least two things. We could say more, but I just want to share two things that it suggests. The first one is this. The way that we treat and regard one another matters because every single contact leaves a trace. Did you know that? I want you, by the grace of God, to embrace this truth. The way you interact and I interact with the person who is behind the register as we're purchasing our groceries leaves a trace. The way that you and I treat the individuals who are bringing our food leaves a trace. When we have paid for services and the services have not been administered in the way that we feel they should have, our response leaves a trace. When we're waiting in a line and we are frustrated, I can't tell you how many lines I've waited in at airports around the world and listening to the frustration of people as it pours out when we are made uncomfortable and when we are frustrated and waiting in line, our contact leaves a trace. When we're in the hospital and our loved one is being uh, waited upon and we don't feel as though they are being given the, 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 the treatment and the service they deserve, We leave a trace. Let me ask you, my dear friends, what type of evidence have you left of the reality of the life-changing, transforming power of the Lord with those that you have come in contact with? It is a sobering thought. It's a sobering thought to think that perhaps, perhaps, instead of drawing people to the Savior, I have in fact pushed them away. The way that we treat and regard one another, let me just share this pearl. You know, God is so merciful that he gives us an opportunity to practice. This is one of the things I love about him. We can practice the way we interact with the world in the ways that we interact one with another. If we cannot treat each other with authentic Christian love and courtesy, the gospel is undermined. You say, no, 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 but I, I would never do that to someone that I don't know. Yep, yeah, but then the people that you do know, the gospel is undermined in their eyes. Because why would you treat someone who you don't know better than the person that you do know? In either way, the gospel is undermined if we do not express love and courtesy and kindness 
one to another. Lastly, oh, I like this one. Being salt doesn't mean that I'm the focus. I know you're like, ah, here's another one of those sermons where the pastor comes and tells us that we need to go out and, but, but I don't know this or that or the other, or I, I don't, I, I'm not as eloquent or I can't speak or, you know, I'm, I, I just don't want to do it. I'm not comfortable doing that. Listen, my dear friends, for those of you that I've called out and you didn't raise your hands, but you were thinking exactly what I said. When you add salt to something, let's say when you add salt to corn on the cob, for those who like savory corn on the cob and not the sweet variety, or those who like salt on sweet corn on the cob. I don't know how you like it, but when you put salt on the corn on the cob or when you put salt in the food, nobody says, man, that was some good salt. That was some tasty salt. If you put salt in your greens or on your, in your corn on the cob or in your casserole or whatever it is that you're preparing, the response is, man, those are some good greens. Those, uh, that was some great corn on the cob. That was a, an excellent casserole. The salt, listen to me, friends, the salt does not draw attention to itself, but the salt draws attention to whatever it is in. If we accept this truth, my dear friends, here's what happens when you and I become salt. Listen to me. When we become salt and we enter into the suffering of others, the suffering becomes bearable because we're there. When we become salt and we are mingled into the difficult times in the lives of others, their difficult times become better because we are there. If you are salt in a Bible study, the people don't leave saying, oh man, she knows so much more than I do. He knows so much more. The people should leave and say, that was a great Bible study. When we are salt, man, I love going to that church. When we are salt, man, that was a wonderful dinner that I had. When we are salt, we do not draw attention to ourselves. Why? Because salt is never the focus. This from a book called Ministry of Healing, page 143. Why don't you read that with me if you can see it? Christ alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men, dot, dot, dot. I didn't put the rest of it there because I just wanted you to focus in on the first part. Christ's method alone will give, what does that next word say? True success. Let me suggest this to you, my friends. It is quite possible for us to experience what appears to be success, but what is not truly success. Y'all looking at me like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Let, let, me, let me just speak plainly. It is quite possible for us to baptize a lot of people. And then three years later, they are all gone. It may look like success when we celebrate the baptism, but three years later, we can see that it is not true success. Oh, am I getting too close to home now? See, they don't have testimony services where they tell us how many people have left the church. We only celebrate how many are joining it. And in doing that, we create a false picture of what is true success. I will tell you as a person who has had the privilege of doing evangelism all over the world, and by the way, nobody gets baptized because of an evangelist. You all don't believe that, do you? God has been working in the lives of men and women, boys and girls, 
long before the evangelist showed up. That's what Jesus meant when he said, we enter into other men's labors. He's already been moving and we were just privileged to come and participate in the work of God. But I've seen men and women, boys and girls who make decisions. That is quite frankly, and it's gonna su surprise you, that's the easy part. The challenging part is helping men and women, boys and girls to walk in the decisions that they have made for Christ and continue to walk and continue to walk. And when they fall, to extend our hands, to reach them and help them to rise again and continue to walk. Christ's method alone will bring true success in doing what? In reaching the people. How did he reach the people? The Savior mingled. Say that word with me. The Savior what? That word mingled, it means to mix. The Savior mixed in among men. The rest of it says as one who desired their good. He didn't go to the different things that were taking place just because he wanted to be seen or just, no, 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 no. He did it so that he could have an influence. As we suggested earlier, Lokert's principle, every contact leaves a trace. He understood this. My presence will leave a trace. When I show up, the place will be different because I am there. No, I'm not doing everything everyone else is doing. No, I'm not drinking what everyone else is drinking. No, I'm not eating what everyone else is eating. But simply my presence changes what's going on in that place. Oh, don't you want to have that type of influence? One of my favorite books, Desire of Ages, says that as a man, Jesus supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with a heavenly current. Have you ever touched someone who's carrying around a little bit of static and you get shocked? Man, I believe Jesus longs for you and I to be shocking Christians in a good way, <laughs> in a positive way. He wants you and I to be shocking Christians so that when people come in contact with us and they rub shoulders with us, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Man, that's not something that I normally experience. It's not something I normally sense or feel. Jesus wants us to reach the world. But in order to reach the world, we must learn to mingle. I'm going to close and say this. Mm, we don't like to mingle. We don't like to mingle. We don't like to mix. We like to be around people who are like us, who think like us, who believe like us, who worship like us. We are most comfortable in that setting. But listen, beloved, if that is our reality and our experience, if that is our ideal, let me just find a place where I can be around people who are like me. My question is this, how? Does God affect the world? If all of his people remain in the salt shaker, if his people don't mix with those who don't think and believe like them, with the purpose of influencing to the glory of God, not to draw attention to ourselves, that's the wrong type of attention, but rather to draw attention to our Savior. I want to be this type of salt that God can literally rub in to the people within my sphere of influence. That I can come in contact with and hopefully, my dear friends, make their experience, make life, make life better because I'm a part of it. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Loving Father and our God, my mind just races with the thought of those who even this very day may feel as though their lives lack meaning and significance and purpose. Some who may, 
God forbid, be on the very verge of ending their lives because they are so frustrated with life. And you have called us as we experience you in a very real and personal way. You have called us to be as salt so that those who are on the verge of going uh, too far, as it were, might experience some of the joys that exist in this life, this side of heaven. That they might sense that life is worth the living because we are there. We are there with a smile on our faces. And that doesn't mean everything is always going right in our lives, but still we can smile because we have a God who is good. We can smile because we have been privileged to see the sun rise another day. We can smile because Jesus is in the sanctuary in heaven interceding on our behalf. We can smile because we know that Jesus will come again. And we can smile because of the wonderful experience and transformational presence of God in our lives. And we know that what you have done for us, you can do for men, women, boys, and girls all over this globe. Oh Lord, help your people to be your salt, your light. Not just protecting and maintaining, but engaging and transforming. If there's someone under the sound of my voice who wants to say, Lord, I want to be salt. I want to be light. And I recognize perhaps today that the savor or the flavor that I have left has not always been a good one either because of my silence or because of my tongue. But Lord, I want you to use me to leave a good taste. If that's your desire, I want you to stand to your feet with me. Lord, I want to be as salt and I want to be as light. Lord, I'm comfortable in the salt shaker but I know I have to get out. I need to come in contact with people who don't know you and I need to be an influence for good. Jesus mingled and so too must I. Not to be cool, not to make a statement, but because the burden of souls rests on my heart even as it rests in the very heart of God. Father, you see those of us who are on our feet today. May we have a renewed experience with you. May the focus be taken away from us and placed back on you. And may we be mindful that everyone we come in contact with, we are leaving a trace. Lord, draw near to us because we need you for this to become our reality. In Jesus' name, let all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, and one of our song leaders will come and lead you. <laughs>